Hey, everybody, welcome back to an all new episode of Dark Chapters with Annie Elise. For those of you who have never seen this channel before, or if you do follow the channel, but you've never caught one of these episodes, let me break down for you what Dark Chapters is. Dark Chapters is a new segment over here on 10 to Life, where we explore some of the darkest and deeply rooted true crime cases out there. The editing style is a little bit different, as is the storytelling aspect of it, but we still are delivering the same true crime content, just a little bit of a darker, deeper case. Now, these episodes are going to air every other Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific time and 8 p.m. Eastern. My goal and what I'm going to try to do with all of the episodes of Dark Chapters is premiere it live, meaning that there will be a live chat box going during the premiere where we can all interact together. We can talk about the case as the episode is playing and really just make it more interactive. So again, set your reminder Make sure you're subscribed if you're not so that you don't miss not only these episodes, but so you don't miss the live chat as these episodes premiere. So without further ado, I want to just set the stage a little bit about what today's episode is about. Now, amongst many things that America is known for, we also know that it is known for a place where dreams can really come true. People from all over the world come to America to further their education, their work dreams, their careers, make the American dream come alive. But what happens when that dream is cut short? Being in a foreign country can be really intimidating, and sadly for some, they come here thinking that everybody has good intentions, when we all know that that is not always the case. So what happens when someone who is pure evil takes advantage of somebody else's situation? Well, today's case is relatively recent, and it is layered with extremely graphic details. So without further ado, we are going to get into this week's episode of Dark Chapters. Dark Chapters. Twenty-six-year-old Yingying Zhang was born on December 21, 1990. Yingying grew up with her parents, Mr. Zhang and Li Fang Ying, as well as her little brother, Zhen Ying, and she grew up in Fujian Province in China. Growing up, Yingying always had a love for learning and for education, and she dreamed of one day becoming a professor in China so that she could help her parents financially. But Yingying wasn't just dreaming. She was actively working to accomplish those dreams, and she was the first in her family to attend college, where she graduated at the top of her class in 2013. She graduated from Sun Yat-sen University, and after that, she moved on to Peking University, which is actually often considered China's version of Harvard. And there, she earned her master's degree in 2016. But that wasn't enough to satisfy her love for learning and for her desire to reach the stars. The more that she learned, the hungrier she became for more education. She wanted to continue to foster all of this education and everything that she was learning. So Yingying became what is called a visiting scholar in the University of Chinese Academy of Science. The UCAS program offers a certain number of scholarships each year to students from developing countries, students who want to go on to work in advanced research and natural science. And Yingying was lucky enough to be one of those students selected, and she was so excited to begin her journey. So she headed to the U.S. in April of 2017, where she would be researching photosynthesis and crop productivity. She was doing the research through the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences at the University of Illinois in their Urbana-Champaign campus. The university has the largest Chinese student population in the country, and Yingying planned to do her program there, and then she was planning on furthering her education and going for her PhD after that. I mean, like I said, she was very dedicated. But while she was excited, the move to the U.S. was still a bit of a challenge for her. See, she didn't really know anyone, and she was feeling anxious and pretty lonely. She had left her family, her friends, and her boyfriend of eight years back in China, and she really missed all of them, especially Shaolin, who was her boyfriend. The two of them had met in college and had immediately bonded over reading, volunteering, shopping, and the way that they could both just have these really deep conversations and connections with each other, sharing the most vulnerable parts of their lives. They even had plans to get married in October 2017. So being across the world from each other was very difficult, but they both knew that it was a sacrifice that was worth it to make and that it would eventually pay off and they would live this great married life. But for the time being, 
Ying Ying was lonely and really didn't have many people to hang out with or people to do things with. And to be honest, she also just really didn't have the time. Ying Ying also had a very big passion for music, and she was actually the lead singer in a band that her and her friends had started in China, which was called Cute Horse. So as a way to help keep her spirits up during this weird transition in her life and give her an extra thing to do, she decided to buy a guitar. Before coming to America, her boyfriend Xiao Lin had taught her how to play the guitar, and it was something that was very, very special to her. Another thing that Ying Ying did to help with the transition to the United States was journaling. She kept a journal where she could write lots of things down whenever different thoughts would cross her mind. She wrote about being anxious and lonely and how the transition was difficult, but she also wrote about her determination to keep trying, and her motto in her journal was this, live a simple life, be effective. So while the transition to the U.S. was a bit difficult, it wasn't all difficult. She was getting to experience some really cool things, such as a trip that she had planned to Nebraska in May. The trip was a research trip with one of her research partners named Guafong. So Ying Ying journaled throughout the entire trip and really enjoyed seeing all of the different sites and different things, also working in the field and having new experiences. She and her research partner and new friend Guafong had a lot of the same interests and they really just enjoyed each other's company. So on top of getting to enjoy the things that they did on the trip, it was just really cool for them to do it together and build this friendship, build this relationship. And then once they returned to Illinois, their regular research continued. So on June 9th, 2017, Ying Ying went about her day like she did any other weekday. She got to turn her hall around 8.30 in the morning to clean some of the equipment that she had been using with some other grad students, and they spent time preparing some of the broken equipment to be shipped out and repaired. So around noon, she told Guafang that she had an appointment that she needed to go to at 1.30 p.m., and this appointment was to sign a lease for a new apartment. At the time, Ying Ying was living on the south end of the college, and she wanted to move to the One North apartment complex to save money. Ying Ying told Guafang that she would be gone for around two hours, but she was also running late and in a rush, so she texted the apartment manager saying that she was running behind, and then said that she would be there maybe around 2.10 p.m. Ying Ying was supposed to come right back, but around 5 p.m., when Ying Ying hadn't returned back from the lease signing, Guafang knew that something was up, something didn't really feel right. She knew it didn't take over three hours to sign an apartment lease, and she also knew that Ying Ying wasn't the type to just skip school, skip the rest of the day after an appointment or after running an errand. She would always come back and finish out her day, or given how responsible she was, she would at least communicate if something major had happened and if she wasn't able to return. The two of them and another team member named Yan were all supposed to have dinner together that night as well, so they began calling Ying Ying to see where she was, what was going on. After leaving Turner Hall, Guafang went back to see if Ying Ying was there, but she wasn't there, and there was no sign of her ever having gone back there. So with the inability to get a hold of her and getting more worried as time was passing, they decided to go to Ying Ying's apartment to check on her, see if she had returned home. They knocked, but nobody answered the door. And so that's when they got really worried, and they decided that now it was time to get some help. The next step was to notify campus police and tell them about Ying Ying, how she was supposed to go and sign that lease for her apartment, but then never showed back up afterward. Initially, the campus police weren't super worried about the circumstances, though, because it had only been a few hours, and they figured it was a Friday night. People go out drinking at bars, they go to parties, and then they typically turn back up the next day. So they figured that it would be the same for her. But as the evening went on, the concern grew. Her research colleagues knew that this was very out of character for Ying Ying, and more specifically, she was not the party-going type at all. On top of that, she was still so new to campus and to America, and she was so determined and focused on her studies that she wasn't going to just randomly leave Turner Hall midday to sign a lease and then ignore the rest of her responsibilities and go out into the city all hours of the night, go partying. But the police wouldn't do anything. So Guafang and the other students waited outside of Ying Ying's apartment until midnight, hoping that she would show up. But she never did. The following day on June 10th, the public began to learn that there was an international student named Ying Ying who was now missing. That was all thanks to a local newspaper deciding to run a story on her after a desperate plea had been made by her friends. 
That day, after Ying Ying didn't ever show up anywhere, the campus police finally started getting more involved. They quickly realized that while Ying Ying had told the apartment manager that she would be there at 2.10 p.m., she actually never even showed up to sign the lease. At 2.35 p.m. that Friday, the apartment manager had sent her another message. In the message, it said, Hey, Ying Ying, just checking in to see if you're on your way. But Ying Ying never responded, and she missed her appointment completely. So that meant that she had somehow disappeared between the time that she left Turner Hall and before she was due to arrive at One North Apartments. They searched her apartment, but they didn't find anything out of the ordinary. No clothes were packed up, snacks were laying out, and overall, the apartment looked very lived in. They checked the airport, local hospitals, the jail, and really any place that she would have had to go to check into or be checked into. But there was no sign of her at any of those places. Ying Ying also didn't have a car, so the campus police had figured that she had to have taken a ride from some type of city vehicle, and they eventually brought in the local police to try and help them solve the case. The police talked to local taxi drivers and also used canine dogs to try and find her, but it was all unsuccessful. They tried to trace her phone, and during that, they found that it had last pinged at the Illinois terminal in Champaign, around the same time that she went missing. Then, it never pinged again. Now, the Illinois Terminal is a large bus and Amtrak station in Champaign, so you can imagine how so many different people go through there daily. And now at this point, with every simple avenue taken to try and find her and no success, the police reached out to local buses to go through their footage to see if there were any sightings of Ying Ying. One bus's exterior camera did catch Ying Ying getting on a campus bus at 1.30 p.m., right outside of her apartment. And then there was footage from inside the bus that Ying Ying took, but it didn't show anything that was out of the ordinary. Rather, it just showed that she got on the bus, found a seat, then sat down. Then cameras showed her getting off the bus. Ying Ying was supposed to catch a second bus, but apparently she actually missed it, and the cameras caught her trying to flag the bus down, but it never stopped for her. A city camera then spotted her waiting at a bus stop in Urbana after not being able to stop the previous bus. She waited at the bus stop, hoping to catch another bus and not miss out on signing her new lease. The camera then showed that just after 2 p.m., a black car drove by that bus stop where Ying Ying was waiting at the time. The car then went around the block and then pulled right up to the curb where Ying Ying was standing. The footage showed the driver rolling the window down before Ying Ying went up to the passenger side window. She and the driver seemed to have had a conversation that went on for about a minute before she ended up actually getting into the car. Now, at that point, after discovering all of the footage, campus police and local authorities really believed that they were dealing with a kidnapping at this point. But the quality of the footage was very, very poor, and they couldn't read the license plate. So they then decided that they needed to enlist the help of the FBI. It didn't take long for them to figure out that the car that she had gotten into was a Saturn Astra. And luckily for them, Saturn Astras aren't common cars at all, so that was a huge help for the investigators. Saturn Astras were only sold on the market for a couple of years, and in total, only 18,000 of them were ever sold. Now, it might sound like a lot, but not when you compare it to the usual amount of cars that are sold. For example, over 5 million Toyota Priuses have been sold, and Ford sells over 200,000 Explorers per year, while even Hondas sell over 100,000 Civics every year. So 18,000 in total is basically nothing compared to those numbers. Investigators were quickly able to figure out how many Saturn Astras there were in the entire state of Illinois at that time as well. So while they were working on figuring out all of the details on the owner of that specific car, the case was really gaining a lot more attention on campus and even around the city. The FBI had put out information that had a photo of Ying Ying, a photo of the black Saturn Astra, and the last time that Ying Ying was seen. The public was desperately searching for Ying Ying. But then, a twist came when the police realized that on the same day that she went missing, a graduate from the University of Illinois named Emily Hogan had called the police to tell them about something that had happened to her that morning. Emily said that on the morning of June 9th, she was waiting for a bus to pick her up at a bus stop when a man wearing mirrored aviator sunglasses pulled up to her in his car. 
He was flashing a fake police badge with a silver star on it, and he was saying that he needed her to answer some questions. Then, he tried to get her to get in the car. Emily immediately realized that something was wrong and said no and started to back away, and then the driver drove off. So Emily called the police, and she also posted on Facebook to share about what had happened to her to warn others about her experience, that this creep was out on the loose. And the details of Emily's situation and Ying Ying's disappearance seemed like they could possibly be connected. As the days went on after Ying Ying's disappearance and the desperation grew, Ying Ying's family decided it was time for them to come to the U.S. Now, at the time, they felt like not enough was being done to find her. So her dad, her aunt, and her boyfriend were able to get visas at the consulate so that they could come to the States immediately and try to take the search into their own hands. However, a lot was actually being done to find her, and tons of law enforcement were working on her case. But I definitely can empathize and understand that for her family, this had to have been the most difficult and scary experience of their lives. To hear that she went missing in a foreign country, a country whose language was not their first language, and a country that they had never been to, and also a country where they weren't familiar with the process of finding someone who was missing, all of that had to have been extremely frightening. Because our processes here in the U.S. are very, very different than the processes in a country like China. And to add on to that, Ying Ying's mom was dealing with health issues, which meant that she was unable to fly to the U.S., and she had to stay back in China as all of this was going on. It was an absolute nightmare for them. But thankfully, the community was rallying around them with donations, and the university even let them stay on campus to at least try and make things a little bit easier on them. On June 14th, five days after Ying Ying's disappearance, a campus police officer named Sergeant James Carter was called in to work on the case. Upon his arrival, it was very clear that the other investigators had been scrutinizing the video footage, all while trying to find the clues, because remember, it was very, very grainy. Now, he knew that the main focus was to see what information could be taken from the grainy footage of that Saturn Astra that Ying Ying had gotten into. It was essentially a near impossible task though, because there was no way that they could get the license plate, and every time they zoomed in, the video would just become even more pixelated. So James decided to look for other things that stood out with the car, and after looking at the footage for 10 minutes, he noticed something strange. He noticed there was a dark spot on the right front hubcap. So after making sure he wasn't just seeing some sort of glitch, he passed on that information to the team. He also noticed that the car had an unusually large sunroof, but he didn't know if what he had noticed was going to be of any help at that point. It turned out, though, that investigators had been able to narrow things down and had realized that only 18 Saturn Astras were in that county. So while narrowing things down, they spoke with all 18 Saturn Astra owners. But at the time, investigators didn't have any strong feelings that one of those owners was the person that they were looking for. But when they heard about James's observation of that dark spot on the right front hubcap, it rang a bell for one of the investigators named Joel, who remembered that one of the Astras that he had seen had a broken right front hubcap, and he had previously spoken with that owner. And that specific Saturn Astra belonged to 28-year-old Brent Christensen. Brent had recently graduated from the University of Illinois, earning his master's degree in physics. During his time at the university, he had been a very respected teacher's assistant and was overall a very liked guy in the department. Brent was also married to a woman named Michelle Zortman. The two of them had gone to high school together and had started dating back in 2008, and then they got married in 2011. But unfortunately, Brent had a pretty big drinking problem, and this problem really affected their relationship. And in an effort to help their marriage, a coworker had suggested that maybe they should try to have an open marriage. An open marriage is when you basically have the ability to be with other partners intimately, whether it is just physically, emotional, all the different marriages and different setups have different boundaries. But essentially, it's just like what it's called. It's opening your marriage up to where there are not strict boundaries or monogamy in place. So Michelle discussed the possibility with Brent. And while he initially was not a fan of the idea at all, a few days later, he said that it was okay. And in April of 2017, he began dating a woman named Tara Bullis. 
On the evening of June 12th, detectives had talked to Brent as they were going down that list of people who owned Saturns and clearing each owner from involvement. And when they had spoken to him that day, Brent initially couldn't remember what he was doing on the 9th. But then he said that he would have either been playing video games or he would have been sleeping. He then willingly let them look inside his car and in his apartment. After remembering the conversation with Brent, investigators went to his apartment complex to look at his car, and they were able to very quickly verify that the car had a crack in the right front hubcap, and also had that large sunroof, which gave them the ability to get a search warrant for the car. Later that evening, around 11.45 p.m., investigators went back to Brent's house to serve the search warrant and try to interview him. Upon their arrival, Brent answered the door, and while he seemed a bit surprised to see investigators back, his behavior and his demeanor was fairly normal and calm. However, what was not normal was what they saw when they entered the home. Michelle was apparently standing near the hallway, completely naked, with her hands on her hips. Now, oddly enough, she didn't seem to care that she didn't have any clothes on and that there were strangers in the house, law enforcement officials at that. She just stood there, completely naked. Now, obviously, the investigators did not feel comfortable talking to Brent with Michelle standing right there completely unclothed, so they asked if she would go and put something on, which law enforcement claimed she refused to do. After asking her a second time, she finally agreed and she was accompanied back to her room by a female detective. In that room, she pulled out a robe to wear, but before putting the robe on, the detective checked the pockets on the robe just as a precaution. Detectives showed Brent the search warrant before then towing his car and asking if he would come to the office to be formally interviewed. Brent turned to Michelle, saying something along the lines of, in these situations, people say to get a lawyer. What should I do? So Michelle told him to just go for the interview. So Brent ended up heading down to the FBI building on his own accord to give this interview. While Brent was heading down there, a couple of FBI agents stayed behind, and they spent the next two hours interviewing Michelle, who was very willing to give any information that was needed. She also signed a consent form and allowed them to search the home and take anything that they thought was relevant. During that search, they found a mirrored pair of sunglasses, exactly like the pair that Emily had described from that someone who was driving that tried to get her to get into his car with the fake badge. They also took many other things, such as bank statements, laptops, cell phones, and external hard drives. Upon leaving the house, the agents gave Michelle a business card and also a cell phone number to reach out if she had any questions. Upon Brent's arrival at the FBI office, he was read his Miranda rights, and he signed a form acknowledging that he was advised of his rights and that he was willing to speak with them. He started off the interview by recapping what he had told the other investigator, Joel, back on the 12th. So they came, they were just checking out all of the Saturn Astros in the area. Mm -hmm. I know it's a pretty rare car, so probably a short list. Um, yeah. He asked where my wife and I were during, I think it was two or three on Friday. And I mean, I graduated a couple weeks ago, so I'm looking for jobs right now. So, okay. I mean, I was either playing video games on my computer or taking an afternoon yeah. So, I was unable to purchase an alloy. I looked into certain things to try and see if I could get some kind of info for an alibi. I sent some texts around that time, but none exactly between two and three. Mm -hmm. um, I let them come in the apartment. They searched for stuff. I let them come in the car. They searched for stuff there. Um, that was pretty much it. Okay. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, give my info. Uh, what'd you uh, graduate in? Uh, master's in physics. In physics? Yes. Well, that's way smarter than me. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the two interviewers, Detective Eric Stiverson and FBI Special Agent Anthony Manganero, tried to keep the conversation lighthearted and somewhat friendly at first, too. Now, clearly, their tactic was to loosen him up in hopes that he would tell them if he knew anything. So Anthony asked Brent if he had any questions, to which he responded by asking why he was under suspicion and if it was just his car. 
and they told him that his car was largely the reason why. So after easing Brent into things, the investigators and FBI agent Anthony and Eric turned up the heat a bit. And you've been at the U of I for how long? Three years. Three. And that you know what we do? I work in the detectives bureau at the U of I, and you know what we have access to? Cameras. Do you think that we're not going to track a vehicle all over campus? We control kiosks to bus stops. We can look in buses. We can look in every building out on the streets. And you're telling me that I didn't see you driving your car on Goodwin. That I didn't see you driving down Wright Street and turning on right in front of a parking where everybody pays their tickets and driving down University to Goodwin and heading south. And then you see her standing on that corner in that shade tree, didn't you? That's where you first saw her. And then you turned, you turned on Clark, and we still have cameras. I've seen the videos, but I didn't see me. You've seen what we've allowed you to see. Can I see the stuff that you're talking about? Do you think that we brought you up here to show you video? We want to we wanna understand why you did it. Yeah. We want to understand why you stopped there to pick her up. Was it to give her a ride? Are you afraid to tell us that you gave her a ride? Maybe you wanted to make a couple bucks as an Uber driver, and she told you I had to go get, I had to go sign a lease at One North, and you're like, oh, I know where that's at. I'll drop you off. If you're afraid to tell us that you gave her a ride someplace, we can work with you there. But I know that you picked her up. I know you did. I saw you in your shirt, arms fully extended. And it didn't take long for Brent to crack and start speaking. And now he was changing his story, saying that he had actually mixed his days up. Maybe I'm getting my days mixed up then. Okay. I thought I drove around on Saturday. I did pick a girl up. I don't remember where. Okay. I saw her picture. I don't think it was her, though. Do you remember the girl's name that you picked up? No, she was talking very broken English. Okay. Tell us about what happened. What time of day was that? Early afternoon. I don't really remember. Okay. I was just driving around. Um, I saw a girl, and she was very distressed. Okay. So I stopped my car and looked at her. Okay. I asked her if she needed help and talked to her for a little bit, not how much. I gave her a short ride a couple blocks. Okay. She freaked out and got out. Okay. That's all it was. He said that the girl told him that she was running late and that she had a meeting with her professor. He claimed that the girl was in his car for less than five minutes, and when he accidentally took a wrong turn instead of what was on the girl's Maps app, she freaked out and got out of the car in a residential neighborhood. He then used one of the investigators' phones to show them on the maps where he drove and said that he went straight home after the girl got out of his car. They then started to talk about Brent's marriage. He discussed how his wife, Michelle, had been out of town with her boyfriend between the dates of June 8th and June 11th. He told them that Michelle being out of town with another man made him feel very, very lonely. So then, they shifted focus back to Yingying and really began putting on the pressure. Again, my... My theory is that she can get out of the car. Um, I'm just being open with you. My, my theory is um, she was in there a little bit longer. Uh, um, I'd like you to be more forthcoming with me because, again, I need to find where she is. Got her family flying over here from China. It's been six days, it's raining outside. I need to find her. We have 600 Chinese students that have volunteered to look for her. What I can tell you is that we will find her. Now when we find her is up to you. Because you know and we know that 
she didn't just get out of your car. So we need to know where she is now so that we can move forward from this. But if you maintain that she just got out of the car and walked away, it's very difficult for us to move forward. Were, were you hoping for um, just kind of like a quick tryst with her or see if, you know, trying to, try to pick her up? I mean, that would have been nice, but... <laughs> Do, do you have, I'm going to ask you a weird question, and you know, a lot of us have fetishes. Uh, how would you describe your relationship with your wife? Are you guys into certain things? Do you like porn? Do you like... Um, we're pretty vanilla together, um, but yes. Pretty much it. We have some stuff in our apartment. I mean, do you have like certain types of people that you have fantasies about that you might want to hook up with? You know, not particularly. No. Oh, is that how people? Well, I'm just about to take. Okay. I mean, have you ever like? Um, you do realize like everything you tell us, we fact check regardless of what you tell us. So, yeah, I know. like stuff like. Uh, YouTube videos that you've seen okay. regarding Asian women. Do you like videos of Asian women? Like Korean women? Like K-pop songs and stuff? I mean... Maybe. I like... Okay, so I like all types of women. Okay. And that's, that's the truth. So, I don't have an Asian fetish. But something drew your eye to her. Because you, you, you were cruising all over, and yeah. if she was truly distressed, I mean, there was an e-phone stand right behind her. She could have pushed that button and, and got help. And she didn't ask you for help, per se. She asked, she needed to get to, she was late for something. Yeah. And that's, so you offered to give her a ride. As they continued to pressure him, he continued to get more uncomfortable. And eventually, he refused to speak at all anymore, which was his right to do. However, by that point, they had enough evidence to arrest him for lying to the police. But after a few hours, he was let go, as law enforcement figured that it would be better to have him live his life normally and perhaps dig his own grave during all of that, all while they kept a constant watch on him. In the meantime, they also got a search warrant for his phone, so they collected all of that data to be analyzed. That same day, June 15th, Ying Ying's family and friends put out a public statement, and they called it, Looking for Ying Ying Proposal. At that point, they did not know that the authorities had Brent on their radar at all. Now, the statement read, and I quote, Dear all, FBI announced yesterday that Ying Ying Zhang's disappearance is a kidnapping case and it appears that the suspect is a white male. Since Ying Ying Zhang has been missing for five days since June 9th, it is possible that the suspect has gone to other states in the US. We sincerely and eagerly ask for your help. Please help us spread the flyer from the FBI and ours through online social media, such as Facebook, Twitter, etc., as widely as possible, and print the flyers to post and distribute in your local community. We greatly appreciate any of your help and action. Let's pray for Ying Ying's safe return. Shortly after that statement was released, the FBI announced that there was a $10,000 reward put in place for anybody who could share information about the whereabouts of Ying Ying. Not only was the FBI offering money, but other students from Ying Ying's school put together a GoFundMe page, and this page was quickly raising a ton of money for her family. Ying Ying's dad, aunt, and her fiancé searched constantly for her, and they received tons of online tips. They also used a psychic in their own searches. While they weren't sure if she was helping or not, they figured that it was better to have something and some help than nothing at all. But each tip they got was not bringing any sort of answers to them. They were continuously hitting dead ends and becoming absolutely emotionally, mentally, and physically exhausted. On June 19th, 10 days after Ying Ying had disappeared, a press conference was finally held with the university and Ying Ying's family. They told the public that they were now working with the local Champaign County Crime Stoppers to seek more information on the case. 
Crime Stoppers was offering a $40,000 reward that had been raised by individual donations, and this reward was for any information that led to an arrest in the case. As the days went on, results from the forensic examination on Brent's electronics came back, and this gave investigators an even better understanding on who Brent truly was. And on his devices, they found various things of violent and sexual nature. Now, one search he had made was on April 19th, and this was on a site called FetLife.com. He searched in a thread called Abduction 101. There were also subthreads included, subthreads called Perfect Abduction Fantasy and Planning a Kidnapping. Now, obviously, this was a massive red flag, but that alone couldn't prove that he was responsible, that he did this crime. They needed something more concrete. On June 27th, the FBI officially told the public that the black Saturn Astra connected to the case had in fact been found, but they wouldn't disclose where it had been found and who was the owner. But they encouraged anybody who had any information about it or who might have any information related to Ying Ying to come forward. Now, it was around that time that investigators were consistently talking with Brent's girlfriend, Tara. And Tara is the one who I mentioned earlier, not to be confused with his wife. And Tara told investigators that Brent had told her a few different things that made her think that he could be involved in Ying Ying's disappearance. So she agreed to work with the FBI and to wear a wire, all to record her conversations with Brent. During a meeting with the FBI, Tara got a text message from Brent saying that he wanted her to go with him to the prayer vigil walk and a concert that was being held for Ying Ying that Thursday on June 29th. Despite being scared, Tara agreed and she wore the wire to the event. And what she recorded is absolutely bone chilling. While walking, he took her hand and he traced the number 13 on it. And then, while sitting on a bench, he took her phone and he began writing in the Notes app. He wrote four separate lines. It was me. She was number 13. She is gone. Forever. So after Tara read these four lines, Brent deleted what he had written. Brent then went on to say how everyone was there at the prayer vigil for him and that they had no idea what was going on and how they wanted her to be alive, but she wasn't. He was drinking during the vigil as well and was getting very excited and boastful while telling Tara what he had done to Ying Ying. As the night went on and they left the vigil, he continued to divulge disgusting details about what had happened. He told Tara that he had killed 12 other women where he had grown up in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, and he told her that Ying Ying was his 13th victim. He also told her that Ying Ying fought back and said, and I quote, she was stronger than any victim I had ever had. Before going into detail about what he did, he said she was resilient, truly resilient. I tried to choke her to death, but she didn't. She was, I just couldn't believe it, like she didn't die. It was unbelievable, like supernatural almost, how she just didn't give up. When Tara asked if Ying Ying fought until she couldn't, Brent said, she was beyond that. I choked her for it must have been 10 minutes with my hands. Then I released her. I couldn't believe that she was still alive. So I carried her into my bathtub. I got the bat and I hit her on the head as hard as I could and it broke her head open. He then said, at that point, I wasn't sure if she was dead or not. So I had a knife and I stabbed her in the neck and she grabbed for it. Then as if things could not get any more disturbing or worse, Brent told Tara that he chopped Ying Ying's head off because he didn't need any of that zombie shit. Referring to how resilient Ying Ying was, how he was trying to strangle her, she wouldn't die, he put her in the bathtub, hit her with the bat, she wouldn't die, he took the knife, stabbed her in the back of the neck, she grabbed it, she wouldn't die. So, according to him, he had no other choice at that point but to counteract what he describes as zombie shit and cut her head off. Now, at one point, apparently Tara told him that they could stop talking about it, but Brent said that he wanted to keep talking about it and that he had been wanting to talk with somebody about it. He told her that the last person he would consider to be at his level was Ted Bundy. And then he reiterated that Ying Ying was number 13 and that he had been getting bored and that Ying Ying was also boring. 
And Brent just kept talking, and it was in such a casual way. So as the two of them keep talking, they start talking about what they wanted for dinner. Brent then casually said that he had cut Ying Ying's clothes off of her and then started doing stuff, but that there apparently was nothing there. So he just didn't give a shit, and so he stopped. Brent showed zero remorse whatsoever and was even laughing at certain points. He told Tara that he would never tell anyone where Ying Ying's remains were, and then he started bragging about how what he did was huge, saying it's bigger than Jeffrey Dahmer, bigger than John Wayne Gacy. I have caught the nation's attention, apparently. I didn't want to, but I still did. This actually wasn't my intention, but I did. It happened. Now, the transcript of what all was said in the hour-long conversation is seriously heartbreaking and disturbing, truly deranged, and every other thing you can think of. It is literally sickening. Now, the recording of it all is really hard to understand, but if you listen to the recording, you can hear a loud thumping throughout it. And that thumping was actually Tara's heartbeat as she was learning what I am sure was the most horrifying information to ever hear, especially from someone you are dating. I also cannot imagine the fear that she had as she was listening to him say all of these things that he was saying. And to think that the whole time he was talking about everything, Ying Ying's family was nearby, at the vigil, with no idea that he was the suspect. And not only that, but that they still had hope and believed that she was possibly alive somewhere. After the FBI listened to The Wire, they realized that they actually had that baseball bat that Brent had been referring to about using to kill Ying Ying and to break her head open. So the bat and the other evidence was sent away for forensic testing. The following day on June 30th, Brent was arrested for kidnapping and was taken in for more questioning. But of course, at this point now, he refused to speak. On that same day, the FBI told the public that they had arrested the main suspect, and they also said that they had captured him on audio, talking about kidnapping Ying Ying. They said that with all of the information they had, they believed that she was no longer alive, but they still didn't know where her body was. They also said that they believed that Brent had attended the vigil and the concert in order to search for his next victim, due to him discussing with Tara what his ideal victim was like, and even going as far as pointing out women in the crowd that were apparently perfect matches for his dark desires, and suggesting that they follow them after. The following day on July 1st, a photo of Brent at the prayer vigil began circulating on social media. A CNN reporter had taken that image without even knowing who Brent even was. On July 3rd, 2017, Brent appeared in court for the very first time. It was a very quick nine-minute hearing where he didn't speak at all except to acknowledge that he understood his rights. After that, he was ordered to return to court on July 5th, where the judge ruled that Brent was being held without bail. Even after Brent was in custody, though, Ying Ying's family still held out hope that she was possibly alive, even increasing the Crime Stoppers reward to $50,000, saying that they would even consider increasing the reward from there if Ying Ying was brought back safely. On July 20th, Brent pled not guilty for kidnapping Ying Ying. Over the next four months, Ying Ying's family continued searching day and night for her, and they followed up on every single tip, and they spoke to anyone and everyone that they could that might have been able to help them find her. By that point, her mom and brother had also flown to the U.S., so the entire family was now in Illinois. They were together, searching for her. But in November, four months after Brent's arrest, the DNA evidence came back from the baseball bat, also from a mattress, and from other things inside Brent's apartment. The evidence confirmed that Ying Yang's DNA was all over those items, which meant that sadly, it was official that they had proof that she was no longer alive, and he now would be charged with kidnapping resulting in death. For Ying Ying's family, this was devastating, and despite previously being made aware that law enforcement didn't think she was alive, this time it was official, and they would have to come to terms with the fact that she was no longer with them and no longer alive. And this was now a recovery search and not a rescue search. Her family also had to head back to China right around that time. They had been in the U.S. searching for her for months, and they had left their whole lives behind. So going back was not an easy decision for them. And it was clear that they were heartbroken to leave the U.S. without their daughter, and really without any sense of where her body could even be. 
between November of 2017 and June of 2019, there was a series of delays that occurred which prevented the trial from taking place. But finally, on June 12, 2019, just a couple days after the two-year mark, the trial finally began. Ying Ying's family had flown in for the trial, and nothing could have prepared them for everything that they would learn and hear throughout this trial. Up until then, her family had been kept pretty much in the dark on most of the details, all in order to preserve the investigation. Even though Ying Ying's body had still not been found, the prosecutors felt like they had enough evidence to argue for the death penalty and to prove that Brent not only killed her, but had also tortured her. Cameras were not permitted in the courtroom, but there were news reporters there listening and taking notes throughout the entire trial. During opening statements, the prosecutor, Eugene Miller, revealed that Brent had a fascination with serial killers and that that all started in December of 2016 when he began downloading photos of women in bondage. He then went into details of the day of the crime. That morning, Brent had gotten up, gotten dressed, and shaved, went and got a bottle of rum before looking for a victim. Emily had turned him down, so then he found Ying Ying, who was running late for her lease signing, but she missed her bus and trusted that he was going to get her there. The prosecution said that once Ying Ying had gotten into Brent's car, he disabled her phone, he tied her hands, and then he took her to his apartment, where he sexually violated her before taking her into the bathtub and hitting her with that baseball bat, stabbing her in the back of the neck, and then decapitating her. After he killed her, he then got rid of all of her belongings, went to the store for cleaning supplies, and cleaned the apartment with Drano and Swiffer pads, before putting in a request for maintenance to come and treat the bathroom for mold. Almost as if he was trying to make sure that all of the evidence would be hidden. But he wasn't as good as he thought, because a cadaver dog was able to pick up on scents that they found in the mattress in his room, which also had three red spots. There was also a dark spot on the carpet all which tested positive for Ying Ying's DNA. Eugene also let the jury know that while Brent had claimed that Ying Ying was his 13th victim, they hadn't been able to find any other victims. And at that point, the evidence pointed to her being his only victim. The defense was up next, and to everyone's shock, Brent's attorney, George Tasef, was very open about the fact that Brent did in fact kill Ying Ying. He was not there to argue that Brent didn't do it. Rather, the defense just wanted to argue why. In their eyes, he wasn't deserving of the death penalty. Just like the prosecution, George also said that Brent did not have 13 victims, but claimed that the FBI aggressively investigated that claim, as if 13 potential victims is not something to aggressively investigate. So George really tried to play on the jury's emotions, saying that Brent was seriously struggling with not only mental health issues and dark thoughts, but also issues of binge drinking and mixing alcohol with medication. He argued that in 2016, Brent began seriously struggling with sleep and depression, which affected both his personal life and his academic life, and it eventually apparently caused him to fail his fall 2016 semester. Brent apparently had gone to counseling and had been open about his dark thoughts. In March of 2017, his wife Michelle apparently had asked for a divorce. Now by that point, Brent was crying in the courtroom, which was actually the first time any emotion had ever been shown by him. So the defense took it a step further to try and give him a hall pass of sorts. The defense attorney, George, said that during the week that Ying Ying was killed, Michelle, his wife, had gone on vacation with her boyfriend. She had gone to Wisconsin and had stayed in the same hotel that her and Brent had stayed in on their honeymoon. Tara had also texted him that week saying that she was having sex with another man. So because of all of this, Brent apparently hit absolute rock bottom. And on the morning of June 9th, he went to the liquor store, he bought a handle of rum, and he drank it and then went and found Ying Ying and killed her. As if that's any excuse. You're getting dumped. You're, somebody else is cheating on you. You have an open marriage. You have all these things. So that's enough to spiral into such a deep depression that you get a handle of alcohol and go looking for a victim to kill and torture. No, it's not at all acceptable. That is not an excuse, but I get it. The defense was just trying to do their job. So after opening statements, the prosecution began, and they brought up a number of witnesses throughout their portion. The first notable witness was Xiao Lin, Ying Ying's fiancé slash boyfriend. 
He spoke about their relationship, their plans to get married, and how they had both graduated at the top of their class back in 2009. He made it clear that they would never give up hope in finding Ying Ying's body either. Meanwhile, a jailhouse informant named Charles was also brought onto the stand. Charles was placed in the cell next to Brent right after his arrest, and the two of them became more or less like friends. Over time, Brent had opened up to him and had told him about Ying Ying and said that he had used a fake police badge to get her into the car. And remember, that's exactly what had happened to that young student named Emily earlier in the day before Ying Ying was kidnapped and murdered. But remember, Emily hadn't gotten into that car even after seeing the badge. So she was then also brought onto the stand to tell her story. They also seemed to focus a lot on two green, six feet long duffel bags that Brent had bought on Amazon, but they were nowhere to be found. Almost like they thought that he had used those duffel bags to dispose of Ying Ying's body. The FBI agent Anthony, who had conducted the interview of Brent, was also brought on the stand to discuss it. Anthony revealed that Brent had made a number of rather incriminating searches after Ying Ying's disappearance, such as making searches about cleaning product ingredients, how iPhone tracking works, and multiple searches about Ying Ying herself, starting the morning after her disappearance. However, Brent's defense team took things up a step further, and they tried to even argue for a mistrial, saying that when Brent asked Michelle what he should do and mentioned an attorney, that it was him invoking his right. But the judge ultimately denied it, because in the opening statements, the defense had already admitted that Brent did in fact kill Ying Ying. Another special agent named Andrew took the stand, and he took the stand to discuss the troubling thoughts that Brent had. He started by saying that Michelle had told him that Brent's favorite book is American Psycho, which is a book about a man who is an investment banker but also a serial killer. Andrew then discussed Brent's counseling and how in counseling he had told the counselor that he was pretty far along in his plans to commit a crime and that he didn't have specific people in mind, but that there was probably a type that he would look for. Andrew then testified about Tara and testified that she had recorded nine conversations in total with Brent, two of which were on the phone. He spoke about the things that were heard on the recording, such as Brent saying that the vigil walk and concert was for him, and also about having some anxiety about being followed and investigated. And as if the details already presented weren't chilling enough, a forensic examiner named William took the stand, and William gave a seriously disturbing testimony. William had the job of analyzing Brent's electronic devices. This also meant gaining access into his accounts. On his FetLife account, Brent had messaged back and forth with someone about a fetish of kidnapping and sexual violence. Brent and the other person messaged back and forth about how they would act out the fetish, and Brent told them that he would break into their house, tie them up, put them into a duffel bag, and then into his car, then even potentially a hotel. The person seemed more worried about the timing of it all other than anything else. And then Brent and the other user even went as far as discussing a letter of consent, just in case the police got involved. And the fact that there are literally people out there willing to go that far and actually getting into contact with one another is just an extremely alarming thought. William testified about Brent's complete obsession with serial killers, which was all over his Google history as well, and also shared that at one point Brent had texted Tara about some new BDSM materials that he bought, and he told her that he wanted her to come over, saying, I want company, because then, instead of becoming a sociopath, I am in a good mood, and I have a good time with someone. And he followed that message up with, fading into nothingness is the default for most people. If you want to know what terrifies me, it's that. I will not fade away. I refuse. I don't care how I am remembered, just that I am. I would rather destroy humanity than let that happen. Throughout every step of the trial, I realized that it just seemed like Brent's behavior was a buildup because there were truly so many signs. The major key witness for the prosecution was Tara, and her testimony was nothing short of informative. Prior to the trial, the defense really didn't want Tara to give any testimony, and they claimed that she had lots of mental health issues, including dysphoria, and wouldn't be able to give a credible testimony. But that was ultimately overruled and she testified that she and Brent had met on OkCupid, and they began dating back in April of 2017. 
She discussed how the two of them participated in BDSM, with her being the submissive and Brent being the dominant. Tara testified about some of Brent's more concerning behaviors, such as talking about how he wanted to kill someone, him thinking it would probably be easy to kill someone, and thinking that no one would know and he could get away with it. She even said that one time he memorized a person's address after seeing it and then went to their house. He didn't do anything at their house, but the fact that he went as far as memorizing a stranger's address and then went to their house really irks me and gives me the chills. She then spent a lot of time going over their recorded conversations, mostly that conversation from the vigil, as that was the biggest one that resulted in the arrest. The prosecution had a couple of more witnesses after Tara before they ultimately rested and it was the defense's turn. The defense decided to bring up the counseling thing again, and it really seemed like the angle being pushed was maybe that the university counseling center should have done more and should have reported what he was telling them, which I 100% agree with, but that also does not give him an excuse in the slightest. Their biggest witness was Michelle who really did not seem happy about being there. I mean, no one would be, but she was very, very reluctant to talk. She talked about their relationship and also their marital issues, and then went into the open marriage and how they had a rule that they would spend more time together than they would with their new partners. She also spoke about seeing Brent walk out of their apartment with one of those big duffel bags after she had returned from a trip with her boyfriend. Now that was significant because the prosecution had focused so much on those duffel bags and they were nowhere to be found. Michelle disclosed that even though Brent was in jail for killing someone and they were divorced, she still spoke to him because she cared about him. She also was very adamant that law enforcement was not being truthful about the details of the night that they had served the search warrant. She said the opposite of law enforcement and claimed that she was in the hall naked trying to cover herself up and did not refuse to put on clothes. The defense's argument also took only a fraction of the time that the prosecution spent and they wrapped things up pretty quickly. After closing statements, the jury was given instructions and after just a couple of hours of deliberating, they returned with a verdict. Guilty for kidnapping resulting in death and guilty on two counts of lying to the police. After the trial, Ying Ying's family gave a speech outside of the courthouse, and her mother absolutely broke down on camera. During the penalty phase of Brent's trial, Brent's father, Michael Christensen, spoke in the courtroom. He first spoke to Ying Ying's family, saying, I'm sorry that my son was the cause of your pain. But Ying Ying's family had left just minutes before Michael took the stand, so they were not there to even hear that. Michael had been the only family member of Brent's to show up every day in court, and he went on to talk about Brent's upbringing. He said that Brent had night terrors and waking nightmares, saying he even had these as an adult, and he discussed Brent's attempt to take his own life when he was just 15 years old. Michael talked about Brent's mom, who struggled with depression and alcoholism, and two of his uncles also testified, saying that addiction and mental illness had run through the family for generations. Brent's defense team pleaded to the jury, saying that due to Brent's upbringing, he shouldn't be given a capital punishment. But the prosecution wasn't having any of that. They argued that Ying Ying's slang was cold, calculated, cruel, and months in the making. Ying Ying's family testified in the sentencing phase as well, and her mother cried through her video testimony, saying, my daughter did not get to wear a wedding dress. I really wanted to be a grandma. After Ying Ying's mother's video testimony played, a female juror began crying and left the courtroom, which led to a recess. The defense tried to argue that due to that happening, there should have been a mistrial, or at the very least, the female juror who left crying should have been removed. The motion, however, was denied. Ultimately, on July 18th, the 12-person jury was unable to reach a unanimous agreement on the death sentence penalty. Ten people voted yes, while two people couldn't be swayed on their no. Brent was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and that is exactly what his defense had been hoping for. Ying Ying's loved ones spoke after the sentencing. I, I want to add something. Uh, for me, for me, for myself, 
the result today seem to tell me that I can I can kill anyone and I can kill anyone with all kinds of cruel method I want and I will not need to die for it and I'd better take some drugs some alcohol before I do it and I'd better act as a loner and then people will now think I'm dangerous people so for me for my own personal opinion the result today seem to encouraging people to do crimes and me myself will never agree with that but for me I do appreciate the, the hard working in these two months of the jury and also the prosecutor, the judge and all the lawyers and everyone in the court. I'm very, very grateful to, to your work. Um, I'm very, very grateful to that. After her dad and boyfriend had the chance to speak, the family's attorneys then took a moment to share some of their thoughts. One of them spoke in English while the other translated to Mandarin. As attorneys, it has been our honor to guide Ying Ying's loved ones through this complicated legal process and to advise them as unexpected participants in the American criminal justice system. As parents ourselves, we have tried to comfort them during this darkest time in their lives. In China and in many other places around the world, the criminal justice system moves faster than in America. The American criminal justice system is slower and more deliberate with the goal of being a verdict that is fair and truly just. This case is a good example of the American system of justice. The result in this case reflects the diligent professional work of so many people. It would be impossible to thank all of them. The University of Illinois Police, the FBI, the other enforcement agencies and the offices of the United States Attorney for the Central District of Illinois and the United States Department of Justice. Really, everyone who worked on this case at both the guilt and penalty phases have been professionals committed to justice for Ying Ying. While the verdict in this case brings Ying Ying's fam family some comfort, they won't have closure unless and until they're able to bring Ying Ying back home. That has been their goal all along. We share the frustration of many that Ying Ying's remains have not been found. We continue to hope that ultimately her remains are located and she can be re reunited with her parents and loved ones in China. Shortly after the trial ended, Ying Ying's family learned even more heartbreaking news. In November of 2018, around the year and a half mark after her death, the prosecutors had struck a deal with Brent's defense team. Brent had told his defense what he had done with Ying Ying's remains, and the deal was that if they told prosecutors, it could not be used against him in the trial. Brent had disclosed that after Ying Ying died, he placed her remains in three trash bags and then put them in the dumpster outside of his apartment. The contents of the dumpster were then picked up and taken to a landfill. However, by the time the prosecution learned about this, it had been nearly a year and a half since her death, which meant that the landfill had since been filled with so much more trash, and finding Ying Ying's body would not only prove to be very difficult, but it would also be very, very expensive and unsanitary. So they did not do landfill searches. Now this was an extremely difficult thing for Ying Ying's family to come to terms with, and they vowed that they would not stop searching for her. Ying Ying's father was absolutely devastated to hear about Brent's confession, saying, if what that man said is true, it further confirms that he is a heartless and evil person we condemn his brutal and malicious action, and we hope that he suffers for the rest of his life as he made Ying Ying suffer in the final moments of her life. We now understand that finding Ying Ying may be impossible. That was also the very first time that Ying Ying's mom had really learned what happened to her daughter. She doesn't speak any English and cannot read Mandarin, so they really shielded her from most of what was going on throughout the search, also the investigation and the subsequent legal process. Eventually, Ying Ying's family needed to head back to China, but before doing that, they wanted to meet Tara. It was an emotional meeting, and Tara had written a message for them prior to the meeting, saying that she had learned how to speak in Mandarin. 
Ying Ying's family praised her for her Mandarin skills, and her mother told her how she was brave and was just as kind as Ying Ying. Hugs were shared all around, and overall, Ying Ying's family was so appreciative of Tara, who had helped significantly with ensuring that Brent would be convicted and held responsible for Ying Ying's death. Ying Ying's family and fiancé have never really been able to find closure throughout the years. Ying Ying's father still talks to Shaolin often about when they can go back to the States to search for Ying Ying more. Shaolin is actively trying to coordinate a trip to get back to Illinois and search for answers. In the spring of 2022, Ying Ying's parents decided to sell household goods on Doyen, which essentially is the Chinese version of TikTok. Ying Ying's father chose to do that in order to produce a steady income for his family. And throughout that journey, he has been met with love and hate due to some accusing the parents of capitalizing on the tragedy. Ying Ying's mom has a really hard time making it through the live streams and has even left due to getting too upset over Ying Ying. She has had an absolute hard and devastating time coping with Ying Ying's death, which has even caused her to struggle with stomach issues. The only positive thing is that they have gone on to become grandparents, which has provided some joy for them throughout the grief of losing Ying Ying, but it will never heal what was broken when they lost their daughter. They filed a couple of civil lawsuits, namely against the university and the counselors, but they were eventually dropped. In 2020, a movie called Finding a Ying Ying was released and you can stream it on Paramount+. Plus. Now, the movie is a documentary style and it gives an in-depth look into the search and legal process of getting justice for Ying Ying. Her friend Jenny, who she went to school with in China, was also a student in Illinois at the time of her disappearance. She had gotten a degree in journalism, so when Ying Ying went missing, she followed her family around and documented their life throughout the investigation and even the trial. This case is so tragically sad, and it is a shame that someone who shined so bright like Ying Ying did had their life taken from them so violently. Ying Ying was so excited to be in America, working toward her dreams, and a truly evil monster took advantage of that. It's horrible to think about the fact that Brent was a walking red flag, and it's even more horrible to think about how the University of Illinois really let Ying Ying down after not taking further steps with Brent after his chilling confessions at the campus counseling center. All Ying Ying wanted was to get a good education so that she could provide for her family, and she never got to do that. She never got to go on to marry the love of her life, nothing. It is beyond maddening when you really sit and think about it, and to know that her life was just so violently snuffed out, and also to think that Brent was excited to hear that he didn't get the death penalty, and now he's just living in prison, which I get is probably no picnic at times, but let's face it, his life now is better than how Ying Ying's life ended. One thing that has been made clear from this case is that Ying Ying touched everyone's life around her in a positive way. And I'm very curious to hear what you guys think. Do you think that he deserves the death penalty? And do you think he is telling the truth about what he did with Ying Ying's remains? Do you think that he used the duffel bag? Or was he being truthful about the trash bags? Do you think that he has any more victims as he had claimed? Or do you think that Ying Ying was his only victim? Regardless what the answers are, we do know that he is a true monster, and I am so happy that he is locked up. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Dark Chapters and hearing Ying Ying's story and listening to the details of her case. If you don't want to miss future episodes of Dark Chapters, make sure to take a quick second, hit the subscribe button, and turn your notification bell to on. Because remember, that will not only notify you of the new episode, but it will allow you to participate in the live chat as the episode premieres while we are all talking live while the case is premiering. All right, thank you guys again, and until the next one, stay safe.